think we are in the room and we are ready to start the panel now. I would like to welcome all of you to this session on adaptation and diffusion of technologies where we have uh, experts from India and Germany joining us. And um, I will briefly introduce um, the panel and the moderator of the session and then request the moderator to take it over for the next set of discussions. So we have had a very interesting day so far. We've looked at governance issues. We have looked at um, um, new business uh, models for um, for urban mobility have focused on electronic uh, electric vehicles so far. Um, and um, in the panel session, we will also look at artificial intelligence, how and that can be used for new urban uh, mobility technologies. And now we are going to speak um, on adaptation diffusion of technologies and to get an outlook on um, these processes and models in India and Germany. To chair this discussion, we have uh, Ms. Michael Puha, who is from the Institute uh, for Technik Folgen Abschätzung und Systemanalyse, ITAS, uh, from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. Uh, Ms. Puha is part of the research group Mobility Futures at the Institute, and her current projects include Profile Region Mobility System, um, Karlsruhe AP5, um, Urban Planning and Social Economic Implications of New Forms of Mobility, and her dissertation um, has focused on transport demand models in the changing world between econometric rationalities and social network obligations. Uh, thank you so much, for Pua, for taking up uh, the discussion here and steering the conversation. I hand it over to you now. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Adi Shri, for, for the kind introduction. Um, me, from my side, I would also like to welcome you to the panel discussion on adaptation and diffusion of innovative technology. Um, the, I think the latest IPCC report makes clear that drastic action is actually needed and that we urgently need to transform the way our mobility system is organized. Um, a lot of hope in India and Germany has been put on the electrification of the mobility system. On the one hand, electric mobility is often seen as a way to create healthier, more sustainable, and more quieter, more livable cities. But on the other hand, it becomes also clear or more, more and more obvious um, that a widespread diffusion also needs to come along with different use patterns and stakeholders to change established routines for planning and governing the mobility system. Having that in mind, it is important to um, note that technology is not only a product of scientific and te technical knowledge, but that it is also shaped by social, cultural, economic and political contexts in which these electric cars, buses, scooters or even bikes are being used. And therefore, I'm pleased to welcome an interdisciplinary panel of three experts from India and Germany who will help us to shed light on the social, economic, technical and political factors surrounding um, electric mobility and its diffusion. Each of the presenter will give us a short introduction to the field um, and straight after we will have the chance to ask questions to the speaker before we proceed with the next presenter. Our first uh, presenter is Dr. Daniel Stetter, who will give us an introduction to the mobility and energy context in Germany. Mr. Stetter is Director of Smart Energy and Mobility Solution at the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering, IAO and his research is centered around sustainable transport, new mobility and smart energy. He has worked as an advisor at the State Ministry Baden-Württemberg and for the Ministry of for Energy, Climate and en Energy Economics Baden-Württemberg and as a PhD candidate at the German Aerospace Center. He holds a doctoral degree in energy economics and systems analysis from the University of Stuttgart in Germany and the German Aerospace Center. Mr. Stetter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Pua, and uh, thanks to the uh, organizers for hosting this event. Um, and a warm welcome uh, to the entire audience on my behalf. Um, I brought some slides and I will try to share them. Please let me know if this works.
just a second. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. So why we're here, uh, this is uh, the reason basically why we uh, work on uh, energy and mobility related issues. It's climate change, it's global warming. I will not leave too many words on this. Um, I will also not leave too many words on Fraunhofer and our institute in particular. It's just I put this in here in case uh, we want to share slides afterwards. I come from Fraunhofer IAO based in Stuttgart and we're dealing with uh, basically how can we make processes more efficient and more climate neutral and in my research unit in particular we're focusing on energy systems and the integration of uh, uh, mobility solutions into the energy sector and in particular the electricity sector. Uh, the German picture is uh, shown here. Uh, we are uh, in the year 2022 and we have um, succeeded in a, a greenhouse gas reduction of some 40% uh, compared to 1990 level. Uh, what is astonishing and eye-opening is uh, the development in the uh, traffic sector indicated in blue here. Um, and you can see that basically nothing has happened here. So that is a great motivation uh, to tap this and to uh, make the traffic sector in particular uh, more uh, carbon neutral. And that's what we're doing in uh, our research. And I'd like to uh, draw your attention to it uh, during um, my contribution. Why is the traffic sector so interesting? It's because gasoline fuel cars uh, are uh, not very efficient. Only 25% of the energy, the primary energy uh, that you put into a car is actually used for, for uh, uh, the purpose of it, uh, namely getting from A to B and 75% are heat loss. So we're dealing with it uh, to, to get over this heat loss, you've got to electrify that drivetrain. And I, I guess many of you know, um, and a prerequisite uh, to, to do so is to, you know, uh, build up charging infrastructure. We, we've done this at our company. And uh, just in case you were interested in it, uh, this is the small commercial block. Uh, we can lead you through all aspects of charging infrastructure and introducing electro cars into your company. But, and this is my point, electrification is not the end of evolution. Uh, we will not succeed in uh, achieving our, our climate goals if we just electrify each and every car that is on this planet, plus all uh, the growth that we're expecting. We have to reduce traffic wherever possible and the remaining traffic uh, has got to be electrified uh, wherever possible. And where appropriate, we have to use hydrogen. Only where appropriate, uh, all the other drivetrains have got to be electrified with battery and uh, battery electric cars. Um, where appropriate and where batteries are not, uh, you know, uh, eligible and uh, the best solution, we got to go hydrogen. And that would be for planes and for ships, for instance, for larger units uh, in logistics. We also got to establish mobility platforms. We got to integrate different uh, actors in the mobility sector, and we got to make this system in general more attractive. You know, we got to increase attractiveness uh, very much the way the Netherlands do it, uh, by the way, uh, for bikes uh, and uh, you know diversify, get away from the car itself. But if we focus on the car, and there will still be many cars in the market. Uh, the question is, where are all these cars going to be charging in the future? And uh, if we're talking about 15 million cars in, in Germany alone, that's 30% of our fleet and 80% of renewable energy. The, the question really is, where are these cars going to be charging? And a huge uh, problem is, um, how can we forecast these charging um, operations and how can we actually uh, plan them. And uh, how can we actually operate electricity distribution grids? Uh, not this way. This is the way we're doing it today. But how can we do it more intelligently? And this leads me to my final slides. It's a proposal for a blockchain based solution 
that combines all actors involved in the ecosystem of charging an electric car. It's the operator of a charging point. It's the operator of a distribution grid for electricity, but also an e-mobility provider and so forth. I will not go through the details. It's just an idea that we need a real-time system that is blockchain-based. And also for the distribution of these slides later on, I put some more details here that I will not go into it. Um, but of course, this system is there and uh, shall um, you know, ease the introduction of electric cars into our uh, energy system. And of course, with the overall objective to reduce CO2. Thank you. And uh, I'm happy to be on this panel. Uh, back to you, Ms. Pua. Thank you, Mr. Stetter. Uh, that uh, just a quick question to start with, maybe. Um, you mentioned that you need um, quite a few different stakeholders to set up the charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Would you say that all of these stakeholders have at the end the same goals? Or is that uh, do they have different or competing goals? And this makes the whole process a bit different or a bit difficult to, to implement. Um, well, if we talk about the ecosystem that I've shown uh, uh, just uh, a few seconds ago, um, these stakeholders have different interests. For instance, a distribution grid operator for an electricity system. The overall ob objective for these uh, folks, and I completely understand it, it's not a critique, uh, is to operate a electricity system uh, within safe boundaries. Uh, their overall objective is not to integrate uh, as many electric cars as possible and to accommodate them. Um, so already here you have a conflict that has got to be uh, met. Um, within a company, you also have many different stakeholders. Uh, you know, think about energy managers, uh, um, also people from the controlling units, and you have to, um, uh, you know, get all of them at the table and um, manage the introduction and the ramp up of electric mobility in a company. So there's two perspectives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And technologically te or technological wise, they like the charging, would you say the charging infrastructure is already appropriate for the users or is there any, like, do they actually have different uh, needs or desires? and we can't technically meet these needs at the moment? Well, um, uh, first and foremost, for the customer, for the user of a charging infrastructure, the, the, uh, the person that wants to switch from a gasoline fuel to an electric drivetrain, um, the system merely has got to work. You know, they, the, they are not interested in how this works. It's kind of like I always compare it to my fridge. I only want the fridge to work at home, you know, and what do I want? I want cold food in my fridge. I'm not interested in the process of a heat pump that actually propels this fridge, right? And same deal with electric mobility. The user only wants this system to work and uh, we're far from this point. Uh, I mean, we have implemented different mechanisms uh, to, um, you know, to accommodate different actors in the system, roaming platforms and so forth. So uh, you can be granted access uh, to any charging station that uh, participates in a roaming network. And that's already a problem. There might be some charging stations that are not in the roaming network. Uh, you don't have full pricing transparency. And let alone uh, the fact that the distribution grid operator has no idea what is happening in its grid. So there's different challenges that uh, are to be addressed and that's uh, our research and our solutions. Um, uh, we're trying to address uh, these challenges. Okay, and, and uh, like from a technological point of view, would you say that uh, like customers like, um, individual customers do need the same charging infrastructure as, for example, um, public or public um, uh, customers need? Or would it be a strategy to, to um, 
set up the infrastructure for for public customers first or for for um, private customers first and then follow up with individual um, customers um well uh w right now we've lost so many years uh for the process of decarbonization uh, we pretty much have to be doing it all at the same time uh, we got to ramp up um uh, publicly available charging infrastructure. Uh, we've got to ramp up charging infrastructure at companies because charging at work is a use case that works because you get there in the morning, you leave in the afternoon, early in the evening. There's a large window in which uh, the charging process can be accommodated. Um, at the same time, charging at home uh, is also a very important use case. So we've, we've got to be doing it all at the same time and ramp up charging infrastructure as fast as possible uh, because we're not um, in a, um, uh, you know, six to seven years ago, we, we had different kinds of discussions. It was rather the, you know, if e-mobility will really see a breakthrough and right now we're leading the discussion as to how quickly we will have to adapt infrastructure in order to meet the demand for charging infrastructure. So um, I, I, I don't think that we can go for, um, in a you know, sequential manner. We have to do it in parallel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would you say, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, you men mentioned that like electrifying cars is not the, is not the solution because not, like not all the problems we have can be addressed by just electrifying cars, but that we actually need a diversification of uh, transport that we need also uh, planes and ships, but also bikes and scooters uh, and buses. Um, would that relieve uh, like if we come to the point that we have a a, 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 a bigger or yeah a bigger diversification of transport means um, would that relieve the charging infrastructure or the need to set up the charging infrastructure as quick as possible? Well, of course, um, already by reducing individual traffic with cars, you have less cars and less charging processes that uh, ought to be performed, of course. Um, and that's why I've always, uh, I, I always show uh, um, uh, my perspective on this uh, besides electric cars. I show my perspective that we have to um, be able to use the best mobility solution uh, in a given context. So sometimes uh, riding my bike is much more comfortable, it's much faster, and it's just a nicer way to get from A to B. Uh, if the weather's nice, if the distance is uh, you know, feasible with, with your bike. On the contrary, if it's a very cold day and it's raining and so forth, the bike might not be the best solution. Uh, if public transport is a good solution in this scenario, it might be a good solution, but there will be a whole lot of solution scenarios where a car, an individual car maybe, is also a very good solution um, uh, for this customer of mobility. And that's why we're working on this, um, always um, bearing in mind that actually we have to reduce traffic as much as possible. Okay. Um, I would like to hand over, like, if you uh, have any questions, um, like, there's no question from the audience yet, but maybe you can just wait and we wait uh, and have the final discussion discussion afterwards. Um, but Mr. Memel, Mrs. Chaduri, would you, do you have any question? Not yet. <laughs> Okay, Thanks. okay, then then I would like to hand over to Mr. Memel. Um, he will give us the second um, introduction to electric mobility or the diffusion and adaptation of electric mobility. Um, 
and he will provide us with an approach with approaches to use artificial intelligence and data driven approaches to support sustainable transport in cities. Mr. Memel studied mathematics and computer science at the Technical University of Kaiserslautern in Germany and works as a researcher and consultant at the German research Re research center for artificial intelligence since 2003. He is head of the Smart City Living Lab, where innovative approaches for the city of the future are tested and researched. So, Mr. Memel, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. And yeah, um, also thank you for organizing this panel. I'm happy to be part of this and also welcome to the audience from my side. Um, yeah, I will um, introduce a little bit our perspective in the Smart City Living Lab. Um, um, regarding AI and data-driven approaches. Um, there's a big hype these days, and I think there are lots of expectations regarding the use of these technologies to support sustainability. And uh, I'd like to, to quote Cedric uh, Price, an architect, who um, asked uh, the question, technology is the answer, but what was the question to his audience in the 60s in a lecture regarding um, the use of new technologies in architecture? And I think we always have to ask ourselves in our context too, um, how can this artificial intelligence and these data-driven approaches support sustainable transport in cities at all? So what are the questions that we, we need to solve? And when I look at this from a policy cycle uh, point of view, we have identified these problems. Mr. Stetter already introduced it very nicely. We have um, cli massive climate change problems. We have problem social problems. We have demographic problems. So we have a lot of issues to tackle in cities, and lots of them are related to mobility. And then these problems uh, somehow land on the agenda. We have a policy formulation. We try to implement measures. We evaluate them, and then we probably uh, solve the problem or we have to reformulate this. And usually our role in AI and data-driven approaches is um, in the aspect of um, helping to implement a solution or to evaluate whether the implementation works or not. And just to give you uh, some, some brief examples, um, here we did some, uh, some project uh, in Germany from um, German Ministry of uh, Digitalization and Transport and um, we try to, to um, kind of improve um, the mobility in a small city in northern Germany, Osnabrück. And to, in order to do so, we, for example, uh, examined whether a potential location for a mobility hub um, would be a good choice or not. For example, by analyzing public transport connections, by analyzing floating car data, and also by analyzing social demographic structure in the city in order to give some decision support to mobility planners. So that's kind of a classical approach to implement measures or to help implementing them and to evaluate whether they are they make sense or not. Or another very popular example these days is Earth observation. So we can use satellite data, for example, to elaborate on land use or to find out about CO2 emissions and stuff like that. So these are the classical approaches that we are usually um, yeah, where we usually have our um, um, yeah, biggest impact in this policy cycle. Um, but coming back to our question, we always have to ask ourselves if this is sufficient. Um, we already have heard it um, only to extend the um, amount of um, electric cars won't solve all of our mobility problems. And it also it's not enough to usually focus on one technological aspect. Um, if we have a problem that has so many dimensions and yeah, such a, that, that is such a holistic issue as mobility. And I would like to draw your attention here to a report um, that I think is um, very interesting. It's from a European research network called Digitalization for Sustainability uh, Science and Dialogue. And they uh, issued a report last year about how digital technologies can support the quest for a real sustainable transformation. And to emphasize two points here, system innovations and sufficiency, I like to quote two aspects that are mentioned in this report. The first is that we should use digital technologies for system innovations to fundamentally change production patterns and consumption practices, and not just for incremental optimization that maintain the status quo. 
So, um, for example, we won't solve our mobility problems if we just replace every traditional car with an electric car. Um, the next one is sufficiency. Um, we need to aim to uh, achieve a satisfaction of needs and enough instead of an ongoing increase, a more. And I think these are two very important aspects that we should always consider when applying technology to, to solve uh, problems in, in society. And yeah, looking back at the, at the policy cycle, I think we really need to be careful not to be misused as an excuse to avoid the changes that are really necessary. And um, that we really need to uh, need to apply for for the transform for the yeah urgent need of of transformation. And um, to bring in a little bit of a German perspective, um, that's a slide that we we often uh, like to show uh, about how a typical project in a German smart city is working. You see here an, an iceberg. You see eighty percent underwater, and. This is the, the uh, biggest amount of our work when we usually work with communities. It's not at all digital at all, uh, not to speak about artificial intelligence. And usually we have to, we need to spend most of our time in finding out um, what information are important for a specific topic, for example, for mobility. And there are lots of dimensions. Uh, in which format is information available? What's the quality of this information? Uh, how can we access it at all? Is it allowed or is it is it free or um, are there some other legal issues to solve out? And uh, therefore, we need to take care of a lot of processes and roles in data governance and data management, which is at least in Germany still a big problem. And you have many stakeholders that are involved when we speak about mobility. So we do not only have the communities, we have the different stakeholders that offer a different means of mobility. And we also have the citizens, of course. And then there's usually also a small part that is more or less digital. So we do all this data integration and data pre-processing. And in the end, uh, if we are lucky, we also have a tiny bit of AI on top. But usually it's not, this is not the, the, um, the biggest part of our work. And because we are so heavily involved in all these processes to talk with all the stakeholders and to, uh, to integrate so many perspectives, I think we also have the possibility and maybe also the obligation to also um, have more impact on, on the fields of problem identification and formulation and on agenda setting. Because we work a lot, a lot with the basic data. We can um, analyze data and visualize data to make people aware of the specific problems and perspectives. So um, I think it's very important for us to have a broader perspective, not only to act as uh, implementers, evaluators, but also in our role as, as researchers that work with cities to also emphasize where the different uh, problems and perspectives uh, come into play when talking about mobility. That's it from, from my point. Thanks a lot. And yeah, I'm happy to hear any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Memel. Um, maybe I uh, take the point again and ask the first question um, and you're really invited to join in, um, but um, in order to make it a bit more like um, practical, could you could you give us an example of how you use data in order to achieve a better or more sustainable mobility system in any city? What were the problems by from the stakeholders there, and what data did you have, and with, which data didn't you have, but that you need actually needed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when I look back at the at the project I was talking about. Um, First of all, we would have needed basically the complete street network and all information about the traffic lights and, and so on from the city. In the end, it never happened because some of the stakeholders were just not willing to hand over the data. And this is always a very individual problem because the processes uh, regarding data exchange are not well established, at least in looking at, at uh, German communities. Um, then, of course, private stakeholders that offer um, different means of mobility, for example, car sharing or bike sharing, are often not willing to hand over the data, uh, for example, about um, where uh, their customers are located, uh, where most cars are used, because I totally understand that from a business perspective, it's your, it's your business secret. Yeah? It's, uh, you, you make money by, by knowing best what your customers want. And um, 
then when I when I look look back at the picture that I that I showed this floating car data, you usually can't get such data as a German community. I mean, um, also for good reasons because uh, you can find out where people living in a certain location are, are going by car. So you can only use it for for research and only in a restricted way, which is totally fine for me. But on the other hand, uh, it doesn't give you the opportunity as a community to find out where from where are people going uh, to to my city in the morning. So people only have rough ideas and you have sometimes you measure cars at a certain point, but only for a certain amount of time. So what's missing is a, usually a complete picture and it's very tough to to uh, um, work on a holistic approach that really um, considers every stakeholder involved in the system. And we won't solve this by means of, for example, of a research project that has only restricted length of two, three, five years. So you would need a, a different basis for really changing mobility in a broader perspective. Okay, now that leads me to another question, because if you are not, if, if it's just not possible that you get all the data that you would actually need, um, how do you make sure that the policy implications that you give are not only focused on the data you have, but only on the data you don't have? You know, because you can't, you can on, only um, like strive out the solutions um, from the data you have. And what do you do about the missing uh, links? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think in, in general, um, I'm not so sure if we need so much technology to define smart goals of how our trans transport system in the city should look like. We know pretty well what thing, what is good and what is bad. So it's not really a matter of technology to define smart goals. And that for me is one of the first things any administration has to do. We know that cities with a lot of individual cars are not the best idea ever. You don't need technology for that. It's a political issue. So um, we can only support uh, the definition of such goals by mean of data. For example, how much uh, emissions do we have because of cars in the city? How much space is used by cars that park in the city. We have data on that and I think um, I think it's not so much uh, a problem of, of this missing data when we try to aim at different a, a different idea of, of transport in general. So later when we implement the details, for example, which uh, bus lines should go in which way from where to where, we would need that, but I think we're not we're not yet there. So sometimes it's rather maybe an excuse to argue with missing data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you focused now on Germany, of, of course, or, um, but, but are you aware of any um, good examples from uh, countries of, of, of middle income or low income countries of how they use uh, data to, to improve their public transport system or their uh, transport system in general? No, I have to admit that I'm usually uh, that we are focusing on on uh, on Europe. So I'm not aware how how uh, countries with a different structure um, try to tackle these problems. Only some anecdotal evidence from from uh, buses and from bus transport in Africa. But we are usually uh, very much focused on Europe. I have to admit. Any other question? Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. Yeah, first of all, I think, Martin, thanks. I don't know what am I going to say after all this, uh, because uh, you pretty much, it was very, uh, you know, pertaining to see a computer scientist talking about politics. Uh, so I think you have covered pretty much what I should ideally cover. <laughs> thanks for that. So I am really curious uh, about that report that you showed. Uh, which is this uh, digital reset report where you said that, you know, the systemic goal that how you kind of change the production and consumption pattern uh, through technology rather than just doing the incremental optimization that usually most of the technologies do. So can you just speak a little bit more about that? How exactly do they talk about how to uh, sort of shift those production and consumption patterns? Um. Yeah, there, unfortunately, there's no simple solution, <laughs> not at all. Um, it's, it's. Uh, I think um, the more it's an, a thing of raising awareness. 
yeah because um usually the the uh, the parts in the process where these decisions are met are not on our side so it's sometimes a little bit of um, a strange thing of becoming more an activist uh, than a researcher because um, mm -hmm. usually we come into play when things are already on the agenda and we can just try to raise the awareness that there are also other factors that need to be neglected and need to be considered and um yeah it's it's a very slow process i think it's there is no simple solution for that so it's it's more a political issue uh, than than a, than a technological issue or uh, an issue that we usually tackle uh, with our daily work in in the context where we are um, acting as as researchers mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, then I would hand over to you, Bidisha. Um, Bidisha Chaudhuri is an associate professor in the domain of IT and society. She received her PhD from South Asia Institute at Heidelberg University in Germany, and her research focuses on information systems for sustainable development, on politics of data and algorithms, political economy of digital identity and sociology of work and automation and AI, AI ethics. So I think it's a very good complement to the talk we just heard. And yeah, Bidisha, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to present and you know, share the platform with all of you. Uh, so I don't have a presentation, so I'm just going to talk because the topic here is adaptation and diffusion of uh, technology. Um, and the over so I thought of talking about adaptation and diffusion of technologies in the broader context of this forum, which is sustainability. So when we talk about sustainability, um, we mostly, you know, sustainability as a concept has a temporal dimension to it, right? So that means that we are trying to figure out that with the limited resources that we have in hand, then how long we can sustain like this, or how our future generations are going to sustain like this. So many a times when we are thinking about, uh, when we have this orientation towards the future, that's what sustainability uh, kind of pushes us to think. Uh, many a times we forget about that, you know, the kind of issues that, are, that we are facing at the moment, at present, right? And uh, why I bring this up, uh, because I think not just about the technology diffusion, we also need to sort of critically examine this whole idea or uh, the focus on the issue of sustainability. Because it's not, it's not a, always a very benign concept to deal with. And it becomes even more important when we are talking about technology per se, because most of the time you will see that uh, all the emerging technologies come with the promise of a better future, right? So I feel that most of the time, this orientation towards a better future or you know, you know, sustainability, which is sustaining for the future generation, we tend to neglect the complexities or the problems or inequities that exist at the moment, and uh, and that is happening right now while creating some of these technologies. So, for example, Martin showed that iceberg, right? So, which, which where he showed that the digital is just the tip of the iceberg, and there is an analog space uh, that goes below it, which is invisible to us. So, most of the time, when we're talking about uh, AI and the hype around the AI, one thing that we tend to uh, believe that AI is also, and it can go both ways. It can think we can uh, think about that the promises that AI will bring, but it all can also bring the anxieties that AI is going to take our autonomy or you know just replace human labor altogether. But what it does not uh, talk about is that at at this moment, how AI is being produced. So the conditions of productions of AI is very much driven by the human labor, which is about the data cleaning, data annotations, and, and many such human labor that goes behind the production of uh, AI. And that's why I'm very much interested in this idea of what are the production functions and production conditions of technology. Uh, and this is where uh, we also need to focus when we are talking about adaptation and diffusion of technologies. Because uh, if we just look at adaptation and diffusion of technologies and 
uh, kind of separate the issues of production from the issues of consumption, uh, then we really do not get the whole picture. So if the production functions are just about being cost effective, incremental optimization that Martin just talked about, uh, adoption and diffusion will always remain a problem. And it will only lead to inequalities. It will lead to differential access to technology. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's not just about having access or not having access. It's also about having what is the quality of the access. So even if I am able to access some of the digital technologies, and this is I'm talking more in the context of Global South, uh, such as India, where people might have access to technologies, but this access is qualitatively very, very uh, abysmal. Right, you it's it's kind of a checklist that I have access, but what I do with that access, how does that actually improve my quality of life is really debatable. Now, this is thinking about adaptation and diffusion. Now, if you bring this idea into uh, the concept of urban mobility and you know how urban mobility is, what kind of changes that are uh, being brought about. So, of course, India, like many other you know, global South countries, uh, smart cities is a big thing. And uh, there are many projects uh, that are being implemented as we speak on smart cities. We, we have the whole smart city mission. Uh, but what actually, when we are looking at smart cities, what we may be in a country like India, where most of the people still do not have an individual vehicle, what kind of work that is being done on uh, accessibility, availability, and affordability of public transportation. So if these are some of the focus, or these are the production goals, that's when we can talk about adoption and diffusion of urban mobility or smart mobility solutions for uh, you know, more inclusive and more sustainable. So I just think that when we are talking about sustainable urban mobility, we should also add, you know, add these ideas of inclusion and accessibility to the notion of sustainability, because otherwise we will only, uh, we'll not be able to address the current inequalities of resources or access that exist right now. If those are not resolved, uh, those are the kind of uh, differences which are going to sustain, unfortunately. So going forward in future, those who do not have access to, you know, better public transportation right now are going to actually be the losers of technology innovation. And this gap is only going to increase if we just focus on sustainability and not inclusion along with sustainability. And uh, this is not to say that technology is something uh, which we don't need or the, you know these innovative technologies we don't need, but to think about that what kind of, not just the what kind of problems that we are solving, because the problems in a society uh, can have multiple dimensions to it, right? So who is, at, who are we solving it for is also very important. And that's where the problem becomes multidimensional and it can be interpreted in many ways. So for somebody, it can be that, you know, you know, reducing carbon emission might be a problem, right? Or might be the problem statement. But for someone who does not have access to uh, affordable transportation, that cannot be the priority. Or we cannot you know, and I'm not just talking about an individual level, I'm also talking about a collective level, even at the level of the government. How does the government decide the uh, what should be the priority? First, creating an affordable transportation system or creating a transportation system which is, you know, more environmentally sustainable. So, and uh, there is no straightforward answer. It's not that I have an answer and anybody have a direct answer to ready-made answer to it. But I think this is the conundrum that a, you know, that a government in a global south actually deals with. So, and it is a very, very real problem to sort of uh, deal with. And I don't think there is an immediate resolution to it, but one needs to think about it. 
the second uh, and the last point that I wanted to make that most of the time, uh, you know, in the globe, I'm, I'm generalizing a bit, but this is this has been a general trend that in many middle and low income countries, uh, we actually do not need very cutting edge high, you know, high tech, right? Uh, we can think about technology in a very simplistic and in a more uh, accessible way. Because when you think about an height, I'll just give an example from a project where I work to make this point and then I'll sort of end this uh, my uh, talk. So um, I worked among small, uh, small holding farmers in uh, Indian Sundarbans. These are the Delta region in, in the Bay of Bengal. And these are farmers who have, uh, they are, they're like not landless. So they have access to land and climate. They have been really badly affected by the climate change. The patterns of climate have really been shifting very erratically and they have been struggling to make, uh, so this has made agriculture a very risky affair for them. So there is, uh, you know, every year there is loss not just of livelihood, but also the crops and, you know, uh, money and other stuff. So uh, I worked with a team, a civil society organization um, there to build a data platforms for them. And here, uh, I am a social scientist, right? So what is my contribution to create and design a data platform? So what the organization, the approach that they took is that rather than bring, and this is something they have learned from other projects, that when you go with big, uh, you know, very high tech solutions like looking at machine learning, weather patterns and everything, they realize that they need to bring experts from outside. And that means that you need to have financial sustainability over a longer period of time. That does not really actually build capacity within the community. So what they thought that whatever resources that the community has, how can we use publicly available data to give uh, agro advisory, which are homegrown. That is, that means that these agro advisories are created by the community members themselves. In that sense that you actually do not need any external support. All you need is an initial push for the community to create this platform. And my role here was to talk to the community members, the farmers, the self-help group members, the younger uh, generation who think of agriculture uh, as a very risky livelihood option and the, many of them do not want to continue with this uh, livelihood options anymore, to talk to all of them, understand their anxieties, understand their need, and then use publicly available weather data and combine them with the local agricultural practices to come up with specific advisory, which can be customized and, you know, change dynamically depending on what is happening around them. So this is a classic case of using technology, but it is, it's kind of a bottom up technology. And it also allows the adaptation and diffusion of technologies in a more meaningful way where the control and the autonomy lies with the people who are using the technology. Uh, unlike many of the, you know, big tech solutions, which are very top heavy and top heavy for a reason, because they're capital intensive and hence you need, and they are also imagined at a scale where you need large players to come in and then collect this data and then, you know, implement these projects. So I feel these, uh, when we most of the time talk about sustainability, uh, these are some of the issues that we leave out and how technologies are produced and implemented has a big, big implication for how they are going to be adopted and diffused within a community. So I'll just stop here and then be ready to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chaudhuri. Um, maybe I just want to focus on, on a point that you made early on in your talk um, when you said that we need the that we also need to tackle the problems that are here right now and not only in the future um, but would you say that we need or that we need to define um, acceptable risks to any technology or is it even 
feasible to define acceptable risks? Uh, I think or potential or potential infringements. Sorry, not just risks, but also put uh, infringements. Uh, what do you mean by infringements? Um, like any side effects that are not welcome. Uh, I feel like this, it's, you know, it's, of course, when you are implementing, you know, or, you know, designing a solution, you will have an assessment of risk and strategies to mitigate it. But, uh, you know, in a very large scale projects, which are very top down, it becomes very difficult to understand or even to foresee some of this risk, right? Uh, and as I said, right, like the priorities are so different depending on where you are implementing them. Uh, so I'll just give you a very small example in one of the smart city projects that we are looking at. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, ground level bureaucrats. So for them, uh, privacy is not his concern, right? When he is collecting and, and, you know, sort of circulating the data within the system for better decision making or better implementation of the project that he is responsible for. So for him right now, that the data is coming at a level of accuracy and the data is flowing at a, you know, through the pipeline that it's supposed to, is his concern. So for him that once this pipeline is in place and stabilized, I'll think about privacy. So the priorities are very different depending on who is looking at the solutions and who is making the decisions. So I think to have a, a very holistic assessment of uh, you know, technologies well in advance is a very, very difficult uh, ask, actually. And maybe a question, it's for, for all of you maybe, is um, do you think that we, can, that, that we need or that, that we are able to evaluate benefits um, only in market terms, like how many charging infrastructure do we have or how many electric cars are on the market right now? Or um, do we need to tackle the normative, the more no normative targets? Um, for example, stability or sustainability, quality of life was mentioned by Mrs. Chaudhuri. And how can we, can we actually evaluate such normative targets? Yeah, I think we definitely need to go beyond these measures. When you look at the criteria that define a smart city, the German smart city charter, they are all not related to such measures. It's about inclusivity. It's about um, happiness of life. It's, um, it's about stability. It's about democracy. So, of course, it's tricky to measure this, um, but I still think you can, you can, you can do this. It's not only about return of investment for sure. I have one question from the audience. I would just read it out. Um, how can the diffusion of innovative technology be effectively promoted in the electric vehicle sectors? And to what extent is this related to technology transfer? Maybe this is a question for Mr. Stetter. How policy can be translated into tech transfer? That was the question, right? Yeah. Um, well, regulation is a fundamental issue with regards to a security for, for investment. So, um, particularly in the highly regulated energy sector. Uh, and I'm speaking here for, for the case of Germany and, and many other um, developed countries in this respect. Uh, we need uh, a framework that actually enables the digital transformation of these huge and cost intensive uh, ecosystems. So regulation has to come first. Um, and basically, much of what is needed to know um, to take the right 
decisions, in my point of view, is actually known. Uh, unfortunately, um, and this is the scientist that is speaking now with uh, all its freedom. <laughs> unfortunately, there is a lot of lobbying going on and uh, uh, decisions that could be taken and actually could have been taken in the past are still procrastinated. So, um, 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 again, a regulation has to come first because a lot of money is in the game and uh, uh, significant investment um, is triggered by market. Uh, there's no doubt about it. We've seen it with soaring energy prices uh, in the past year, uh, while at the same time, um, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, when it comes to the details. So um, there's uh, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of way to go. Um, I have another question for Ms. Chaudhuri, maybe, um, because you you were talking about um, the the example from the farmers in the more um, rural area in India, and um, if you think now of electric mobility, um, can you can you like share with us what would be what do you think uh, in which context? Um, or under which circumstances electric mobility would be beneficial in a more rural context in India, because we were just talking about or mainly talking about urban mobility right now. Um, and I think, or in my impression, it's not that far away, maybe from from the European context, what you need in, in this in a city context, but maybe in a rural in a more rural context. Um, how would that be in India? I think in the rural context, uh, you know, I'm, in this might be a very controversial answer. I think all we need to do is to control the consumptions of a certain kind, because I think the problem in rural India, and, and of course there are many, multiple layers of rural India, there is not just one type of rural, uh, you know, India, but uh, urban lifestyles are also looked at as an aspirational lifestyle, right? So mm -hmm. trying to own a car, having, you know, fancy cars or non electric like fossil fuel cars and all. These are sometimes becomes aspirational. But if you actually look at the basic lifestyle, so when I go, people mostly using bikes or uh, a certain kind of uh, rickshaws which are, you know, already not using any fuel, basically. So if you're just strictly focusing on the transportation part, there are uh, already sustainable ways of doing things. So I think the problem here is that when we try to intervene with new technologies in these places and you know bring in a certain normative uh, ideas with these technologies, right? By normative ideas, I mean that modernization, progress, and all those. Uh, they kind of, in a way, has the potential to also disrupt some of the old sustainable ways of uh, living. So the place that I was talk referring to, they actually, you know, there is very, very limited use of, uh, you know, non-sustainable transportation, if I may call it. They mostly use bikes and, you know, rick rickshaws, which are human pulled. Uh, and uh, it's only through modernization they got this very faster rickshaws, which are um, diesel run. And this came about two, three years ago, and which has become a real pollutant in that area. So, again, this is the proximity to the urban ways of life and trying to, you know, uh, make it faster when you don't need to make it faster that uh, all these things I'm kind of, I think, simplifying it a bit right now, but uh, I think there is this consumption patterns sometimes needs to be also looked at in these cases. Would you say that there is a risk then in electrifying the transport? Because not, then it, it, it appears to be a clean technology and a clean way of moving forward. 
but mm. actually they people have now a clean way of moving you know so would you see a risk there in 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 this technology yes. then yes because i think it will take me back to what uh, martin's question earlier right if technology is the answer what is the question i think many <laughs> of the times uh, the you know we have already thought about the solution and then you know it's like when you have a hammer in your hand you're constantly looking for a nail so sometimes uh, you know technologies become that hammer that we have this you know great technology in hand and somewhere it actually worked and you feel like wow it has so much potential so let us apply it everywhere and in that fascination with the technology we sometimes we forget that you know it's not that it's going to it's not always related to risk or harm sometimes it's just not needed so you know so i think that is that, that risk is always there Mm -hmm. But in our mm -hmm. fascination with the technology itself, we tend to sort of go overboard about it. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would straight away pass that question over to um, my German colleagues. Like, what, what, how do you see that in the European context? Would you also say this is a could be a kind of a problem that, um, yeah, the technology is there and that we um, electrify transport which is now green actually like bi bikes or scooters uh, i will start okay martin um, um you know um i you know obviously from my german uh, uh perspective uh as a highly developed country and so forth. Uh, it is super easy to say that those that ride a bike so far should continue riding a bike. Um, but if you uh, consider uh, the discussion on a more broader level, on a global level, uh, how could I uh, argue that people in uh, the so-called uh, developing countries should not um, pursue the kind of, uh, you know, or, or obtain the kind of living standard that I've enjoyed uh, over the course of my entire life so far. So uh, I will uh, um, leave it by this question. No, I, sorry, I, I think you've got me wrong. Um, I, I didn't mean uh, to judge the Indian context, but I wanted you to judge the German context. Aren't we at risk in Germany as well that we think we have a technology with, which is superior to the one we had before uh, and that we are now electrifying everything, even though um, we can use bikes now and we can use our feet now without the use of any electrification i don't see that risk because uh using a car is not uh, driven by the aspect of um of, of of the way it is propelled you know um i i understand your point um and i think um we should always um You know, if if we want to uh, become carbon neutral, we have to do everything we can, and uh, we gotta um, pursue a lot of different policies. Um, and as I said, um, for me, in the context of mobility, it's the best solution for the respective use case that that uh, has got to be accessible. And uh, so that people um, uh, think that riding a bike is the best solution, you have to establish appropriate infrastructure. And uh, if the appropriate infrastructure is there, and if the bike is the best solution, it will remain the best solution, even if cars are electrified, whether they are electrified or not, the bike will continue to you know, be the best solution. So I think uh, mobility policy has to have the overall goal to decarbonize, yes, and to um, to to provide infrastructure that enables uh, the people to 
to use uh, the most carbon friendly uh, mode of transport. And if we want more bikes, we have to build up more bicycle infrastructure. <laughs> and we are very much at the beginning in Germany in this respect. Okay. Um, uh, same deal with uh, logistics and trains. I mean, even uh, um, you know, uh, secretaries from the Green Party now uh, um, uh, are in favor of electrified trucks. And uh, it, it, in the first days when I heard this, I was wondering why is that? And the simple solution is because our train infrastructure is, you know, simply not capable of uh, of uh, you know doing the job. So. Uh, we have we have another system that is capable of doing the job and that is trucks on the autobahn and that's why even green secretaries um now say we have to electrify these vehicles so um sorry that my uh, answer was kind of broad now, now but uh, maybe also shortly elaborating on this um I think it's definitely a point worth a discussion, but it's not the, the main issue that we have to tackle now. We also talked a lot about, for example, if these electric scooters are replacing a, a worse kind of mobility by means of the people do no longer use cars or, or will it replace a, a walk on food? Um, we're just about to, to learn uh, to learn about that, but I think I don't think it's it's uh, it's really the uh, a big problem these days. So we have different problems that uh, or bigger problems that need to be in the focus of any discussion. Which doesn't mean that we should just uh, support anything that's uh, yeah electrically driven and and think it's good. But um, I think it's it this won't be the the biggest issue in when we want to provide a more sustainable mobility. Okay, any further questions or any questions to one another? Okay, then I would uh, just uh, very shortly wrap up the whole session. Um, I think it was very interesting. We had a broad, um, broad expertise on very different topics uh, with regards to adaptation and diffusion of technologies. Um, we first heard um, a uh, yeah a, a major view or an, an overview on um, the technology and its entanglement with the energy system and how important it is to set up the, the charging infrastructure um, in order to get that uh, electric mobility actually running. Um, and then we had um, a, an overview on data-driven approaches um, and, 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 and an overview on how we can actually use and uh, use data and what we need, what kind of data we need in order to 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 solve the questions uh, the the problems ahead and then last but not least uh, we had mrs chaudhuri um opening up on the on a societal view on electric mobility or on on um, sustainable sustainability and innovations in general um and the question of what actually the good life is and if the good life is always for for everybody the same or if if we need to discuss on what actually the good life is and uh thank you to all the speakers uh, i really enjoyed the session um yeah and um also uh, thank you very much for the organizers everything went very well and smooth um so yeah goodbye and um yeah thank you time. Yeah, thank you so much for me. Thanks a lot for taking time out also in the pre discussions and um, today to give your inputs. This has been an interesting session. I was listening in the background, learned a lot. Um, and uh, we would like to um, ask you to stay back for a minute as we close the day, wrap up the day and the conference at the same time. And to the participants who've been here in the audience, thanks a lot for your time. Um, uh, 
the um, a couple of recordings from the sessions will be available from our website a little bit later. And uh, for those of you who joined through the platform, you will still be able to access some of the networking aspects of the event a little bit later. So thanks a lot. We will close the event here and I request then the speakers to stay back for a minute. Thanks and I see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.